the historical roots of the rapidly expanding cult of Mary with the worship of ancient goddesses and other pagan practices have been examined in an earlier chapter. Such links now seem to strengthen what we assumed before, or even proved before. The New Age movement is undoubtedly advancing on many fronts, not least in the church which will not endure sound doctrine having itching ears. Many Christians have drunk deep drafts of New Age potions. For example, holistic health, hypnosis, yoga, inner healing, meditation, psychical research and awareness training and many have imbibed new doctrines and heresies based on the humanistic and positive thinking of Taylor de Chardin, Norman Vincent Peale and others which provide the church with its emphasis on an earthly kingdom now, the social gospel and society reconstructed for Christianized with kingdom principles for the Lord's return. Restorationist leader Bryn Jones, writing in the beginning of 1991, promised his followers that, quote, by the power of his spirit, we will bring all that is against God and man beneath Christ's authority. God's church will be the most influential body of people on earth in the final period of this age. Unquote. This is indeed a prophetic word, but it is fulfilled in scripture only by the Apostate Church of the Book of Revelation. Hello and welcome to a new video from Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth. This video is called Bible Prophecy and Bible Versions, dealing with Chapter 19 of the current book reading that I am doing All Roads Lead to Rome by Michael de Semlian about the ecumenical movement. And there was an opportunity, um, yeah, <laughs> I took him a little bit by surprise, that was on a day of our Bible study with Tom Fress normally. But um, I asked him if he wanted to do this reading with me of this chapter because I've just finished chapter 18 today in German and English and then chapter 19 in German and I thought this would be one that Tom would really enjoy to be on. And since last time when we did our recording of the greatest Trojan horse of them all in the, uh, you know, the recording of Behind the Dictators, we had technical, uh, uh, technical problem. I hope that I could get him on today and normally we do Bible study on a Saturday and that of course is not recorded. Um, I asked him to permission to record it and um, that he was doing with me chapter 19, the reading of All Roads Lead to Rome, of um, the chapter that I just said is called Bible Prophecy and Bible Versions and he agreed on that. So without any further ado, I will lead you to listen now to the recorded uh, Skype call that I had with Tom on the 29th of October 2016, reading chapter 19 of All Roads Lead to Rome. Enjoy! On page 193 we continue your reading here. The author recognizes that for all the weight of evidence, all the lessons of history, all the testimony of great men, the reader will not fully recognize the role of Rome nor the roads which lead to her unless God, in his grace, quickens the understanding through his word. That is true. Only when you have the Bible as a basis of understanding it is even makes sense to read books like this. Yeah. Yeah. An understanding of the interpretation of Bible prophecy held by the reformers and those who have stood up to Rome before and since is therefore important to the message of this book. Yeah. Many Protestant commentators point out that the interpretation of biblical prophecy is now almost all futurist. The system which they believe was evolved by the brilliant Jesuit theologians Francisco Ribera and Cardinal Bellarmine after the Council of Trent. They see futurist scholars as evolving eschatological theories and systems faster than theological colleges can absorb them. The view that the Antichrist is still to come, 
and that therefore the passages of Scripture relating to him are not for today, has undermined the faith of Bible-believing Christians and is the principal reason why so few now recognize the office of the papacy in Scripture as the false church which has opposed the true faith for almost 1,500 years. I have a comment Please. for your listeners. And this is very important. This is the key to understanding. Now, I'm sure Michael DeSemlian is quite capable uh, of, of laying out the reasons why the Jesuits uh, had to foist upon the world what is known as futurism. Futurism asserts, and this is refresher for you because we've talked about this uh, uh, well, it's the bulk of my discussions. What futurism is, what its purpose is, and and how it has deceived God's people. This is critical information that everyone must know. First of all, the Protestant Reformation was built on two planks. Number one, we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and the scriptures are the word of God. End of subject. Okay, number two, that the papacy is, was, and always will be the antichrist of the Bible. <clears throat> now, the realization that the papacy and only the papacy fulfilled all the Bible prophecies concerning the little horn of Daniel, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, because it became so widely believed and true in the Middle Ages, in, 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 uh, in uh, the 1500s, that the papacy was the Antichrist prophesied to come in the Bible. <clears throat> and every pope is the Antichrist. There are no good popes. Just like there is no good man of sin, there is no good son of perdition, there is no good Antichrist, there is no good little horn. <clears throat> Rome, uh, the Christian world, finally realized who the Antichrist is. And so they left the Roman Catholic Church and, and became Protestants, believing that Christ alone was their king. And the papacy was not the king of kings, nor the lord of lords, but the Antichrist of the Bible. Now, prior to the Protestant Reformation, with many, many true Protestant exceptions throughout history, the kings of the earth gained their offices from the pope. They gained their cr the pope literally crowned many of the kings of Europe, and those who accepted the crown of rulership from the pope realized that <clears throat> the pope could take that crown away too. And that's what made him the king of kings and the lord of lords. And uh, the Protestant Reformation, the realization once they understood the scriptures read in their own languages they understood that the papacy was the antichrist the man of sin the son of perdition the little horn of daniel and there could be no one else they rebelled against their papal governments they liberated themselves they no longer paid indulgences to the roman catholic church they no longer answered to the authorities that were established in the world to represent the pope in other words, they overthrew this pretended king of kings and lord of lords for the true king of kings and lord of lords, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So the papacy lost its power. The, the papacy at one point was, for lack of a better description, uh, forgotten. He was no longer a power to be reckoned with. And so the Jesuits at the Council of Trent decided to reverse that trend. 
and to restore to the Pope all the authority to rule over all the kings of the earth, not just of Europe, but the whole world. And so that's the mission of the Jesuit order. And what was the first thing they had to do? They had to close the minds and stop the mouths of the Protestants who heralded from the rooftops unanimously that it was the papacy that was the Antichrist <clears throat> spoken of in the Bible. Because as, lo <clears throat> as long as the world recognizes the Pope as the Antichrist, the papacy as the Antichrist, they would diligently observe their own governments to make sure that their governments did not answer to Rome, that their governments did not use their legislative power to impose upon the people Roman Catholic canon law, that the civil governments and the laws of the land were, were Christian, not papal. And so the Jesuits, in order to restore to themselves control over the kings of the earth, had to change people's minds about the papacy's role as the Antichrist. And so they began to suggest what we almost uniformly believe in this country and around the world, <clears throat> that the papacy is not the Antichrist, that the, that the Antichrist is some future individual, not a whole dynasty of popes from the beginning of the Roman Catholic Church to the present. And each, each papacy individually is the Antichrist, but that the Antichrist is one man that doesn't show up on the, on the world scene until just seven years before Christ's return. And so because the Jesuits were so successful at changing the minds of what were once known as Protestants who protested the papacy, who protested the Antichrist, give him room as, well, for lack of a better term, a Christian, the leader of the largest Christian church in the world, one that claims to be the church that Jesus Christ founded. And as, as hard as that is for, for people to believe, it's not necessary from Rome's point of view that they believe that but that they believe the Pope is not the Antichrist, but the Antichrist is just one individual that comes just before Christ's return. Exactly. You see, if they, see, if they believe that the, Pope, that the Antichrist is just one single individual that has not yet shown his face on the earth, well, then we don't have to worry about the papacy. We don't have to worry about the governments of the world, and let's talk about our own government, specifically the United States of America and our legislative body, the Congress, adopting and imposing upon the American citizens laws that directly or indirectly make us subject to Roman Catholic canon law. But that's what they do. The laws of this country, the civil laws of this country, directly and indirectly make us all subjects to the Roman system. And that, by default, makes us all subjects of the Roman pontiff, the Roman papacy, the <clears throat> Antichrist of the Bible. You see what effect futurism has had? Pro there's virtually except for uh, just a few minor exceptions in this world, there's nobody that believes and preaches that the papacy is the Antichrist. In other words, Protestantism is virtually dead. And so the Jesuits have defeated Protestantism, which was their, their sworn oath in the very beginning that they would annihilate Protestantism from off the face of the earth, that there would be no one left on the earth to protest against the authority of the papacy. There would be no one left on earth to, to insist that the papacy and every pope in succession is the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the little horn of Daniel. And they've, they've achieved it. Yeah, and we... 
through futurism. And we record this on the 29th of October, two days from the 499th anniversary of Luther nailing the 95 Theses to the church door at Wittenberg. Isn't it remarkable that they've been able to achieve this and even publicly announce in their certain way, publicly announce that Protestantism is dead. Yeah, you're referring... And they've done it on the nearly the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. It only took the Jesuits 500 years yeah. to completely destroy Protestantism. And how did they do it? By preaching that the papacy is not the Antichrist, but one individual that hasn't even showed up on the face of the earth yet. Yeah, we believe and now that. that. And now that everybody believes that, they're all willing to have communion with the Roman Catholic Church. They don't object if their civil laws reflect Roman Catholic canon law and and make us all subjects of the Roman pontiff? That's right. Go ahead. Yeah, we will we will go into uh, with a few parag within a few paragraphs into something very nice that I already had a few minutes comments on when I read the German version and probably I will have a little comment here and you will probably <laughs> extend on that when we are talking about preterist and futurist school but that's a few paragraphs from where I'm reading right now. Anyway, this is recorded the 29th of October 2016 and with that only two days away from the 499th anniversary of Luther nailing his 95 Theses to the church door at Wittenberg on the 31st of October 1517. And we all know what is going on in 2016 when the Pope says that he is going on Reformation Day, the 31st of October, to Sweden to celebrate there the Reformation today and we all are looking forward to what is happening next year in 2017. My mother told me that she listened to in the German news that they said that from next year on Reformation Day in Germany will be an official holiday. How much more are they going to mock the Protestants? Yeah. <laughs> Making it a holiday but not telling the people what's it all about. Never speaking of the Antichrist, of course. Well, and, and it's appropriate to mention now that for a long time uh, here in the United States, uh, prep, uh, Reformation Day uh, isn't even recognized. I mean, by Protestants, Reformation Day isn't. Uh, Protestants go out trick-or-treating on yeah. Reformation Hall Day. Halloween, yeah. And, and Rome just simply replaced Reformation Day with, with a diabolical, satanic-inspired holiday a fun holiday for children mm -hmm. and of course if it entertains the children the whole country goes with it yeah. and 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 so and so for the love of the children we let them go out and celebrate some diabolical ghosts and goblins and and demons and witches and warlocks and and every other abominable thing in the name of in the spirit of fun and celebration, in 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 uh, you know, in deference to uh, the the nature-loving uh, ancient pagan religions, and it's was used to be known in this country during the colonial period as Reformation Day. It was celebrated a day of worship for the Lord that light and life had finally come to God's people after the world had been a thousand years locked in the darkness of Roman Catholicism. Mm. You know, they didn't call it the Dark Ages for nothing. <laughs> no. The light of the scriptures was 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 utterly absent. absent. Yeah. They 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 burned the Bibles, they burned people that read them. They made the Bible so convoluted with the Latin that nobody could read it for themselves. And so nobody knew the truth that Jesus was the Christ and the papacy is the Antichrist. Well, when they finally started to translate the Bibles into the languages that the people could read, and not just the Roman Catholic priests who read Latin, a language that was dead and not understood by the masses of people, when they began to print the Bibles in in the language of the common people, the Holy Spirit then descended upon the people and they overthrew the Pope. Well, those days of papal rule have to be restored. And so they had to destroy any notion in the world 
stop any voice that would claim that the papacy is the Antichrist. And in so doing, destroy Protestantism and make the world Catholic. That's what it, that's that's what Michael Dissemblian is writing about. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, on the bottom of page nine, 193, I continue reading. Other Protestants do not agree that the emphasis on a future Antichrist subtracts from the witness of Christians to the errors of Rome. Quote, Thousands, nay, tens of thousands of Bible believers who believe in a future person, the Antichrist, and utterly uh, are utterly opposed to Rome, unquote, says Spices-based businessman Michael Pentfold. Quote, Jesuits have not undermined their faith since the Bible declares that there were many Antichrists in the day of the Apostles. Unquote. There is no question, however, that futurism and preterism, and now it becomes very interesting, there is no question, however, that futurism and preterism have made a profound impact on Bible colleges and pulpits alike during this century, the 20th century when this book is written, and most of the last, the 19th century. These theories were propounded by the Jesuits as powerful instruments of the Counter-Reformation soon after the Council of Trent, but made little impact until the 19th century. And we are going to discuss that in a few moments, Tom and me, about, how about that. The Roman Catholic Truth Society has defined the two schools of interpretation of Scripture as follows. Now, listen closely to this coming quote. The preterist school founded by Jesuit Louis Alcazar in 1614 explains the book of Revelation by the fall of Jerusalem in A.D. 70 or by the fall of pagan Rome in A.D. 410. The futurist school founded by Jesuit Francisco Ribera in 1591 looks for Antichrist, Babylon and a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem at the end of of the Christian dispensation. Unquote. Now, okay. why uh, is this so important? Let us first yes. go into the last paragraph that I just read. The preterist school founded by Alcazar in 1614, that's the 17th century, explains the book of Revelation by the fall of weather in Jerusalem AD 70 or by the fall of pagan Rome in AD 410. So Rome is not even sure when preterism happened. Yes. They contradict themselves when they teach, well, whether it happened in Jerusalem in AD 70 and maybe Nero was the Antichrist or Vespasian or whoever was at that time the Emperor of Rome or it was by the fall of pagan Rome in 410. Well, we are yes. talking about 340 years difference and we are talking about the same teaching of the same church. And then even worse, then comes the Futurist School founded by Francisco Ribera in 1590 not 91, in 91 he died. He wrote the book in f between 1585 and 1590. And that looks for an Antichrist Babylon and a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem uh, to the end of the dispensation, at the end of time. So the future Antichrist that Tom was talking about, the seven years before Jesus Christ returns because of the false explanation of Daniel's unfulfilled 70 years week, something else they teach. But <coughs> you have to understand, dear listener, one big discrepancy here. The Preterist School and the Futurist School are both coming out of the mouth of the Roman Catholic Church. That's right. And they contradict themselves so much that they cannot be put together. It is whether Preterist or Futurist. Yes. Let, let me explain to the listeners in case a few of them are a bit confused. We've already talked about Futurism. In order to change the world's mind from the Protestant view that the papacy is the Antichrist... They fomented the notion that the Antichrist is a single individual that comes just before Christ's return, and he will be the Antichrist. There's only one man that's going to be the Antichrist. And so if you believe that, then the papacy and every pope in succession for over a thousand years, 1,800 years, is not the Antichrist. It exonerates the papacy. We've talked about futurism, okay? So I think the listeners understand what futurism was intended to do. But we haven't talked about preterism in detail. See, Rome is desperate to destroy any notion in the people's minds 
that the papacy could even be the Antichrist. So they came up with two false choices. You who believe, as the Protestants unanimously believed, that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist of the Bible, Rome offers two alternatives in order to save the papacy from that belief. Number one, the first false interpretation of Bible prophecy was called preterism. It was never widely believed because of certain specific scriptures in the Bible that talks about the man of sin rising out of the fourth and final beast of Daniel's vision. That had to be the Roman Empire. But Rome foisted upon the world an alternative interpretation of the prophecies that made the Antichrist uh, come before the rise of the papacy. <laughs> that was either Alexander the Great or a Grecian, by the way, that did not come out of the fourth and final empire on the earth, or it was uh, Nero, one of the pagan Roman emperors, uh, Caesars, or any other alternative. You can believe anything you want as long as you believe that the Antichrist was destroyed before the rise of the Holy Roman Empire. That is, the Roman Empire ruled and reigned by the papacy. And so... Preterism was the first alternative, the first false, I will emphasize the word, a false interpretation of the prophecies, putting the onus of Antichrist onto some pre-existing uh, uh, man in the world. Like I said, Alexander the Great or Antiochus Epiphanes who sacrificed a pig on the altar in Jerusalem or, or Nero, one of the most bloodthirsty Roman emperors, uh, Roman Caesars, <clears throat> and that once this Antichrist was destroyed, then came the rise of the Holy Roman Empire under the control of the popes, and ever since then, since Antichrist has been vanquished, I, it's, ever I since it then, cough, the but... papacy has believed yeah, and no. taught that the Holy Roman Empire will create a, an everlasting empire headed up by the papacy. There's your Antichrist. And, and just to make sure the listeners understand, preterism was believed, but not widely. And so they needed an alternative false interpretation of the prophecies, which we've already discussed thoroughly that is futurism. That one, that lie, is almost universally believed. Absolutely. So where Rome failed with preterism, they have more than succeeded with futurism. And so the Jesuits are victorious, absolutely victorious. Protestantism is dead. Nobody believes that the papacy, the quote-unquote holy Roman Empire, is the man of sin, the son of perdition. And so uh, they believe in a future man that, that hasn't shown up yet, and everybody's hand-wringing about it while the, while the Roman Empire, the holy Roman Empire headed up by the Pope, has regained all the power it ever had with the governments of the world. Mm -hmm. And, and the, I'm speaking to the people that are listening from the United States of America. This applies just as equally to those who are listening from Europe and around the world. Rome vets all the candidates for king, queen, potentate, president, whatever. And when you go to the polls to vote, you cast your vote for any number of papal picks. You cast your vote for any number of people that have been vetted by the Jesuits who will be friendly to this new world order under the Pope. And no matter who you vote for, listen, let me just say it in terms that everybody can understand. If you burn one drop of gas to go to the polls to vote in any election, you've wasted that drop of gas. Unless you want the Pope to rule supreme both over spiritual things and over temporal things. 
If you want the Pope to rule unchallenged in the world in all the churches, and if you want the Pope to make the laws of the land of every land in the world and subject all of the of its people to the authority, the rule making of the the law making authority of the Pope, then you just go to the polls and vote. It's as simple as that. And all because there is no more Protestantism in the world. There's no one that says that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. Me and Yerk being the only exceptions, and we don't count. Because nobody's listening. I've been, I've been preaching this to people for nearly 20 years now. And it should have led to a revolution all over the world, another Protestant Reformation all over the world, but people don't want to hear it. They're too busy, <clears throat> you know, with their lives. They're too busy making a, making money. I'll tell you what, until God's people wake up, you're going to be stripped of your rights. You're going to be stripped of your livelihoods. You're going to lose your jobs. The governments of the world are going to be brought low and and. There are going to be other countries in this world, some that were world-renowned for being superpowers are going to be brought down to the level of Greece. And this is what we get for losing our Protestantism. This is what we get for forgetting who the Antichrist of the Bible is. This is what we get for allowing the Jesuits to fill our churches with lies and liars behind the pulpits. This is what we get, not reading and understanding our Bible in light of Protestantism. And uh, look, if God's people won't wake up voluntarily, then persecution, tribulation, destitution is going gonna, is gonna to rule the day. God's not going to allow his people to be ignorant forever. And uh, it's going to be painful. It's already painful. And if we don't repent with sincere hearts and return to a Protestant understanding of the Bible, then God has no choice. Look, he punished the Israelites for always falling into idolatry. Who is the biggest idol in the whole world? It's the papacy. And the world idolizes him, calls him for all, of all things, a godly man. <clears throat> the man of sin, they call him a Christian. You can't get any dumber than that. And now we're going to pay. Our <clears throat> God is righteous. And he's merciful. He's not going to allow us to remain in this, this futurist and preterist ignorance forever. Look, it ought to be easy for everybody to understand that the Vatican, for almost its entire history, has had to deal with pedophile and sodomite priests. Well, that should have told us something. It's a global epidemic. It's a global pandemic. Rome has been plagued with sodomite priests for its entire existence. It's not the Church of Jesus Christ. It's the Church of Antichrist. The Protestant reformers, as unanimous as they were, were absolutely correct on that matter. And it's been completely forgotten. There isn't, but I, I, I hate to exaggerate, but to get the point across, there isn't a handful of Protestants in the whole United States of America. Whereas in the, in the days of the early colonial period, they were almost all Protestants. And they knew what Protestant was. And they knew what Protestantism meant. Now we have the Antichrist of the Bible addressing Congress. And what do you suppose the purpose of that is? <laughs> to make sure our laws conform to Roman Catholic canon law. Why do you suppose there is a supermajority of Roman Catholics on the Supreme Court? To make absolutely certain that the civil laws of this land 
are interpreted by Roman Catholics and that Roman Catholic canon law becomes the law of the land. And you know what happens <clears throat> every time, excuse me, every time in the world when Roman Catholic canon law became the law of the land, God's people were slaughtered. Unrelenting slaughter. <clears throat> and they were slaughtered with fervor. Blood ran bridle deep in the streets. If you believe and teach that the Pope is the papacy is the Antichrist, your blood will be shed without mercy. That is the definition of history. That has defined all of history. Are we going to suffer that kind of persecution again? Many of us will, but we won't even know why we're dying. You can't get more ignorant than that. No. Back listen, to you, Yerk. Listen, Tom. Yeah, I, I, I have to, <laughs> I have to go on a little side road here, because you mentioned that the visit of the Antichrist last year, 2015, uh, to a joint session of Congress and what that actually entails. And I have to go back to another book that you and I read, Rulers of Evil, the very first chapter, Subliminal Rome. On page two of the book, you read, in fact, when the Holy Alliance story hit the stands, there was virtually no arena of federal legislative activity according to the 1992 World Almanac of U.S. politics that was not directly controlled by a Roman Catholic senator or representative. So when Tom talks about what does it entail that the pontiff, the pontifex maximus, the antichrist, comes and speaks in the temple of Jupiter, which the capital is, to a joint session of Congress and Senate to the United States of America last year. Get a load of this, what Tapper Saucy wrote in his book. The committees and subcommittees of the United States Senate and House of Representatives, so where the Antichrist addressed it to, this speech last year, governing commerce, communications and telecommunications, energy, medicine, health, education and welfare, human services, consumer protection, finance and financial institutions, transportation, labor and unemployment, hazardous materials, taxation, bank regulation, currency and monetary policy, oversight of the Federal Reserve System, which is neither federal nor has it any reserves, commodity prices, rents services, small business administration, urban affairs, European affairs, Near Eastern and South Asian affairs, terrorism, narcotics, international communications, international economic trade, oceans, environmental policy, insurance, housing, community development, federal loan guarantees, economic stabilization measures including wage and price controls, gold and precious metals transactions, agriculture, animal and forestry industries, rural issues, nutrition, price supports, food for peace, agricultural exports, soil conservation, irrigation, stream channelization, flood control, minority enterprise, environment and pollution, appropriations, defense, foreign operations, vaccines, drug labeling and packaging, drug and alcohol abuse, inspection and certification of fish and processed food, use of vitamins and saccharin, national health, insurance proposals, human services, legal services, family relations, the arts and humanities, the handicapped and aging. In other words, virtually every aspect of secular life in America came under the chairmanship of one of these Roman Catholic laypersons. And now he continues with a list, but therefore go to Rulers of Evil and read it for yourself. But the point is that every aspect of the secular life that I've just read to you is under the chairmanship of a Roman Catholic. And then you have 
20 years almost after the publication of that book in 1996 and 2015, the Antichrist visiting a joint session of the Senate and the Congress in the Temple of Jupiter, the capital in Washington, speaking to his Roman Catholic laypersons that regulate your life from cradle to grave. That's what happens when you do not understand who the Antichrist of the Bible is. Now yes, the Tom. people should finally be able to realize that every important department in our government, all the dom domestic laws, all the national laws, all the international laws and policies are headed up by department, government department heads that are run by Roman Catholics. This is what happens when you fail to realize who the Antichrist is. They first and foremost must make every government of the world subject to the Roman pontiff and subject to Roman Catholic canon law. That's why Catholics are so avid politicians. They run for public office. They run for local municipal office. They, lo they run for school board. They run for state legislator, county legislation. It's wall-to-wall -wall Roman Catholics while the Protestants remain sleep, sleepy in the belief that, well, they're just Christians like you and me. And, uh, and it's not just the United States, but this ought to have answered the question of many people's minds all over the world. Why has the United States become a crusading nation? Why is the United States the warmonger of the world? And for what purpose did the United States go to, go to so many wars? It's to conquer the rest of the world for papal control. It has nothing to do with democracy. It has absolutely nothing to do with freedom, especially freedom. I mean, after all, if you're all forcibly made subject to the Roman pontiff, that's not freedom. That's bondage in idolatry. Okay? That's the man of sin ruling the whole world. And, and the United States of America has literally become the battle axe of the Pope. Now you understand the wars of the world and for whom they're fought. And if there's any doubt in your mind, I would like to listen to your credible arguments to the contrary. Literally, the world is reshaped into the image of the pre-Reformation Holy Roman Empire. That's what people call the so-called New World Order, where it yes, is absolutely the uh, only the um, re-establishment of the Old World listen, Order. Listen, listen. Uh, 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 what's what's the word I want to What's the word I want to use here? It's it's uh, sound bites. People remember sound bites. Well, here's one for you. One that you'll never forget. The New World Order is not new at all. It's just a global reestablishment of the Old World Order. There's your soundbite. The New World Order is simply the Old World Order restored on a global basis. And who is most responsible for the global reestablishment of the, new, of the Old World Order? the United States of America and her militaries and her intelligence and State Department and presidents, congressmen, senators, right on down to your local school board. And the United States, the, the so-called Protestants, evangelicals in the United States are completely deaf to this knowledge. They don't want to hear it. All they want is peace and unity. That's the success of the ecumenical movement, what this whole book is all That's about, Tom. Michael DeSemlian's book is about. I highly recommend this book. Of all the books in my library, and I have many, many, many favorites, this has got to be one of my favorites of favorites. It's an absolutely essential read. I agree. I'm going to continue on page 194. Jesuit futurism and preterism 
in opposition to what was the prevailing view of Christians, now known as the historicist or historical view, set out originally to divorce the Antichrist, the man of sin, the little horn and the mother of harlots, from the here and now and from medieval and modern history. Between them, these interpretations succeeded in excluding the entire 15th century period of the papacy altogether from the understanding of Bible prophecy. They did so by stopping short of the beginnings of the Roman Church in the 5th century, and then by projecting forward beyond our day into a fragment of time in the indeterminate future. The historicist or historical view sees the prophecies of Daniel, Paul and John as fully and faithfully laying out the entire course of Christian history and I can not continue reading without making a very important comment. My guest on this show today, on this reading, Tom Fress, has twice read the book Romanism and the Reformation by Henry Gretton Guinness. And I still revere this, one of the most profound works he's ever done. This lecture you can follow on my YouTube channels. I've uploaded 10 or a little bit more episodes so far of more than 30 to come. But my point is, Romanism and the Reformation from Henry Gretton Guinness, written in 1887, Lecture 1 deals with the Daniel Four view of Romanism, Lecture 3 deals with Paul's Four view of Romanism, and Lecture 4 deals with John's Four view of Romanism. What did I just read in the book of Michael de Semlian? The historicist or historical view sees the prophecies of Daniel, Paul and John as fully and faithfully lying out the entire course of Christian history. Now listen to Tom Fress reading Romanism and the Reformation, Lecture 1, 2, 3 and 4. The Daniel, the Paul and the John's four view of Romanism. And you will have no doubt anymore in your life who the Antichrist is, as you also should not have when you followed this whole book reading here. But I had to make this little um, excursion to Romanism and the Reformation, a book I highly recommend everyone to read. You can get it for free online as a PDF. You can watch for free online on my channels, the reading that Tom Fress did. Or you can even go to First Amendment Radio, where all parts are already uploaded from another reading, where he did the reading of the same book. So, Tom, you have a little comment here? Yes. Uh, first of all, I want to reiterate, to make sure everybody understands, the beliefs held by the Protestant Reformation, the true Church of Jesus Christ, were historicist in their beliefs. They were neither preterists, nor were they futurists. They were historicists. And what you can remember about historicism is that it is the belief that the papacy rose right after the fall of the pagan Roman Empire, and that's when the man of sin, the son of perdition, was, was revealed in the world. <clears throat> yeah, we could even That's bring... the one that has per persecuted the saints, is guilty of the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus, for nearly 2,000 years, Paul predicted the immediate rise of the Antichrist. Why? Because he was the nearest apostle to its uprising. So did the apostle John. And they both knew it was a Roman. It would come out of the fourth and final empire on the earth, the Roman Empire. And it wouldn't come to power until after the Caesars of the pagan Roman Empire departed Rome. They all knew that he that was taken out of the way was going to be the restrainer. And once that restrainer was taken out of the way, then that man of sin would be revealed. When the pagan Roman emperors, the, when after we had known as the, the fall of the Roman Empire, what came in its place was the quote-unquote holy Roman Empire, and it's the most wicked empire of them all. Yeah. 
Paul foreknew this, John foreknew it, Daniel foreknew it. They all prophesied about it. There's no mistake about it. It's absolutely true. It's the only interpretation that fits with both Scripture and history. That's why we call it historicism, that the whole history of the Roman Catholic Church, the whole history of the Protestant Church has been told in history. It's all been witnessed. It's all been documented and written. As a matter of fact, what, what the, the most valuable nugget to me in Henry Grattan Guinness's book is a prayer that was prayed anciently by uh, the first century church. Yeah. And it proves, it proves beyond question that the believers of the first century church knew that it was going, the Antichrist was going to come after the fall of the Roman Caesars. Yeah, Immediately to... after the fall of the Roman Caesars. And they, writ, they wrote, a, was prayed communally in the churches, praying, for, believe this or not, they were literally praying for the longevity of the pagan Roman Caesars. Mm. As brutal as they were, feeding Protestants, or Yes, Protestants. Yes, that's right. They were Protestant before Protestants, Protestantism was cool. They were Protestant in their belief. They knew that after the fall of the Roman Caesars, the ones who fed them to the lions, an even worse regime would come to power in the world. Mm -hmm. And this prayer is written verbatim in Henry Grattan Guinness's book, uh, Romanism and the Reformation. Read it for yourself. And it's proof of what the first century Christians believed and taught, that the yep. pagan Roman Empire would be replaced by the Holy Roman Empire, an even worse and bloodier institution. And knowing that Rome, or the, that the United States has become the battle axe of, of, of the Roman Catholic Church, now you understand why the United States never misses an opportunity to launch Air Force and its, its military, its Navy, to go around the world to shed whatever blood the Pope needs shed. Yeah. Okay, back to New York. Now, let me make an interesting statement on Hegelian dialectic that everybody can understand. Take the thesis of preterism, mix it with the antithesis of futurism, and you come to the synthesis, which is called historicism. It neither happened in the past, it neither doesn't happen in the future, but it happens now and it has happened in history as the Bible tells us about. If you want to use Hegelian dialectic, preterism is your thesis, futurism is your antithesis, and out comes the synthesis, which is historicism, which is the Bible. That will lead you into the real truth of that. Historicism recognizes the Roman institution which claims to be the universal church as the whore posing as the bride of Christ and identifies the little horn of Daniel 7, the man of sin of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and the mother of harlots in Revelation 17 and 18 as the papacy and the false church. There are two great truths that stand out in the preaching that brought about the Protestant Reformation. American Bible commentator Ralph Woodrow reminds us. Now to remind you, dear listener, Ralph Woodrow is the author of the book Babylon Mystery Religion that I read in completion on my channel. At the time of the writing of this book, which was published in 1993, Ralph Woodrow still stood for his book, but in 1999, Ralph Woodrow recanted of his book. And the views expressed here by Michael de Semlian in his book of 1993 of Ralph Woodrow are views that Ralph Woodrow does not sustain today anymore. For that you can go to my playlist Babylon Mystery Religion and watch the video A Weak Recantation of Ralph Woodrow's book Babylon Mystery Religion. But anyway he says here, quote, The just shall live by faith, not by the works of Romanism, and the papacy is the Antichrist of Scripture. It was a message for Christ and against Antichrist. The entire Reformation rests on this 
twofold testimony. Unquote from Ralph Woodrow at that time. Ian Murray, in his much respected book The Puritan Hope, describes the reformers as unanimous in their belief that the papal system is both the man of sin and the Babylonian whore of which scripture forewarns. Rome was the great antichrist and so firmly did this belief become established that it was not that it was not until the 19th century that it was seriously questioned by evangelicals." Unquote. From Ian Murray, The Puritan Hope. And what is this whole book dealing about? The evangelical movement. So, that the Pope is the Antichrist of Scripture was seriously questioned by evangelicals. And that is a movement that was set in motion by the Roman Catholic Church. Now the next quote comes from Dr. Henry Gretton Guinness, author of Romanism and the Reformation, from his book. Quote, Thousands of martyrdoms have sealed the testimony against the papal antichrist. And on this testimony rests the Reformation. To reject it is to reject the foundation of the noblest and divinest work which has been wrought in this world since the day of Pentecost, said Henry Gretton Guinness at the end of the 19th century. He wrote his book in 1887. The next part of the book, All Roads Lead to Rome, in the chapter 19 that we are reading and discussing today, Bible Prophecy and Bible Versions, the next part is called The Little Horn of Daniel. The reformers identified the papacy in the persecuting little horn of the book of Daniel. John Wycliffe asked, quote, Why is it necessary in unbelief to look for another antichrist? In the 17th chapter, of da in the seventh chapter of Daniel, the Antichrist is forcefully described by a horn arising in the time of the fourth kingdom, wearing out the saints of the Most High. Unquote. The reformers believed, as do many Christians today, that the little horn of Daniel 7 had risen out of the fourth beast, the Roman Empire, and sprung up among the ten kingdoms into which the imperial Rome was divided. The little horn is diverse or different from the other kingdoms. The papacy claimed spiritual as well as temporal power. The little horn has a mouth that spake very great things and shall speak great words against the Most High. Over the centuries the papacy has repeatedly laid claim to rule the world as Christ's representative Vicarius Fili Dei, the Vicar of Christ, and insisted that there is no salvation outside of the Church of Rome, as you all probably know from all my other readings and Tom's explanations in the past, Antichrist Bonif Pope Boniface VIII, with his bull Unang Sanctam of 1302, stated, and I will quote that out of my heart. I don't have the quote before me. It is absolutely necessary for the salvation of every human creature to be subject of the Roman Pontiff. It, is, it has also claimed to speak with infallibility on matters of faith and doctrine, usurping God's authority and contradicting his word. 1870 the time of Vatican I, the first Vatican Council, the last big thing Pio Nono, Pope Pius IX, put in motion, a few years before his death. 1870 was the first Vatican Council, after he published such works as The Syllabus of Errors, something Tom and I have often referred to in the past in other videos. You can look that up. And at that very first Vatican Council, the Pope was declared unfallible when speaking ex cathedra on matters of faith and doctrine. By that, elevating himself up to God, because only God is infallible. Now in Daniel's vision, the little horn had eyes and his look was more stout than his fellows. 
The Pope, who lays claim to the keys of the Kingdom of Heaven, is set to watch over more people than any other leader. He is responsible for pestering some 900 million souls across the world today, remind you, 1993, the time this book was published. Today, 2016, I think we can count about 1.5 billion Roman Catholic souls. And, of course, because of the successful ecumenical and charismatic movement this book deals with, more than 50 years after Vatican II is closed, it is quite safe to say that at least 2.5 billion people are under the so-called responsibility of the Roman Catholic Pontiff, the Antichrist of Rome, because all apostate churches have gone back under the wings of Rome. The little horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them, and would wear out the saints of the Most High. Many believe that this part of the prophecy was comprehensively fulfilled over the many centuries of Papal Rome, Rome's ruthless persecution of Bible-believing Christians, through the Dark Ages, during the Inquisition, and right up to the French Revolution. And I have to add, even farther than the French Revolution, because you have to count all the wars after that, and surely World War I, World War II, and all the wars after that, and all the wars that are going on right now. Remember, since 9-11, 2001, we are on a continuous, quote-unquote, war against terror, a, according to President George W. Bush, crusade. And who is the biggest crusader, the only crusader? Always the Pope, right? The Roman Catholic Church. We are on a crusade. We are, well, working the Inquisition, but not using the name anymore, because today it is the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, you know? Did, did, but did, because did, did, your listeners, did your listeners hear what you just said? I hope Let me so. reiterate what, what <laughs> Kirk just said. I want to make sure your listeners heard what you just said. The United States is the global inquisitor for the Pope. You remember the Inquisition? Have you ever heard the Inqu of, about the Inquisition? That's even been erased from people's minds. There, there was an organization set up within the Roman Catholic Church, a circuit of priests that went from town to town to town, that rounded up all Protestants, those who protested the authority of the Pope, and burnt them all at the stake. And uh, there's the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. It was the Holy Roman Inquisition. And the Inquisition has simply just gone underground. Of course, they would have us believe that it no longer exists. But what has really happened is it has grown exponentially in the name of the American military. And now it's not a circuit of Roman Catholic priests in black hoods going around and holding these inquisitions, these trials, these fake trials, and, and murdering people on the t by the tune of millions. But it's a global military force that imposes the papal will on the whole world and kills by the most sophisticated means available to man, even space-based weaponry. Smart weaponry. Look, the advancement in military and bloodshedding uh, technology has grown beyond our ability to comprehend. And the desire to kill on that magnitude with that much ease could only be the invention of the quote-unquote Holy Roman Pontiff. And that's what the United States exists in the world today, as the Holy Roman Inquisitor. That's why the people of the world kowtow to the United States. They know that if they don't, they could be annihilated in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. <clears throat> that's how long it takes a nuclear weapon to de detonate, the twinkling of an eye. 
And the whole world fears the global inquisitor, the United States of America. And whatever happens to this country, though its people be brought to absolute destitution, there will always be an American military that will carry the sword, the battle axe for the Pope. And they'll do it at our expense, both in blood and in treasure. The once Protestant United States of America, the colonial Protestant America, has become the second beast of Revelation chapter 13. And it causes the whole world to worship the first beast, Rome. Now, I know that's not going to sink into a lot of people. It's just so much contrary to what we've been taught in the churches. What have we been taught in the churches? You're okay, I'm okay. We're all saved, we're all going to heaven, and yet we're all become subject to the Roman pontiff, and we all fight his wars for him. We spill blood all over the world for his benefit, and we do it even at the expense of our own blood, <clears throat> our own guts, and our own fortune. And nobody protests anymore. You can't get more apostate than that. Sorry to be the bearer of such grim tidings, but even words can't express the horror that I feel deep down in my heart when I contemplate the truth, the biblical, historical, and prophetic truth of the United States of America. And any, any country around the world that goes to war under the leadership and guidance of the United States becomes just as guilty of, the, of, the, of Rome's bloodshed. And the world begs for peace Peace, peace, when there is no peace? And who has taken peace from the earth? The papacy, through the United States and her allies. When they say peace and safety, sudden destruction will come sudden upon them. Sudden destruction, and it's coming from heaven. And I don't want to be on the receiving end of that kind of bloodshed. Oh, no. And I've repented long ago. I now come to the Protestant understanding of the Scriptures, the biblical understanding, the same understanding that was had by the first century church. And now I seek a kingdom not of this earth. And I have let go of this earthly kingdom that serves the Antichrist. Now, for the first time in my life, I'm truly free. They have still control of my body, but not my heart and my spirit. And that's the reality that we all must face or be subject of that wrath that is going to descend from heaven. Back mm. to you, Yerk. Okay. The last paragraph of this part of the chapter. The little horn, still from Daniel 7 would think to change times and laws. The papacy has not only changed human laws, but divine laws too. It has annulled and abrogated the laws of kings and emperors and relatively recently, in 1870, as I already mentioned, claimed itself infallible in defiance of scripture. It has presumed to annul marriages and ordain a celibate priesthood in place of the biblical model of married pastors. Times have been changed too. The calendar of Pope Gregory has replaced the calendar of Emperor Justinian. There are all the many different saints' days, and we have a Christ's Mass or Christmas to celebrate our Lord's birth and the pagan goddess Astartes festival Easter for his death and resurrection. I uploaded a video some time ago on my channel where Tom Fress gives an explanation of the so-called holy days and explains that only the one who is holy can make something holy and not the papacy, which is not holy but unholy. 
The next part of this book is called The Man of Sin and the Mystery of Iniquity. And here we can come back into the wonderful prayer that Tom mentioned from the book of Romanism and the Reformation from Henry Grattan Guinness. The Pontifical, the Special Service Book. Uh, that's called the Pontifical. It is a special service book used for papal services in St. Peter's in Rome. Addresses the reigning pontiff with the dreadful words, quote, Lord God the Pope, unquote. Writing to the Christians in Thessalonica, Paul describes the man of sin, the son of perdition, quote, And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Unquote. From Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. There seems to have been a remarkable consensus of understanding among the early church fathers and the reformers in equating the little horn with the man of sin revealed by Paul in the second letter to the Thessalonians. Yes, of course, there is a remarkable, remarkable consensus between the early church fathers, the apostles and the reformers because they were adhering to the Bible and the Bible alone. Sola Scriptura, the credo of the Reformation, the credo of Protestants. So when you adhere to the Bible and the Bible alone, how can you have more than 30,000 different denominations? The church fathers, the early church fathers and the reformers agreed on have a remarkable consensus of understanding of the little horn and the man of sin. Of course, because they are biblical. They are historicists, at least the reformers. The early church fathers were no historicists. They were making history when they were going along. They believed that the man of sin and the mystery of iniquity already at work in Paul's day would follow the fall of the Roman Empire. And here we come to the point where Tom made a few minutes ago the mention of the prayer that Christians prayed in the time of the Roman emperors to long the life of the Roman emperor, of the Caesar, because they knew that when the Caesar was taken out of the way, the Antichrist would come, as we can read in verses 7 and 8 of Second Thessalonians chapter 2, quote, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed. Unquote. Tom, you got a comment here? Yes, notice that he refers to the long line of successory uh, uh, pagan Roman emperors as he. Singular. And the Bible does the same thing about the popes refers to him as the he, man of sin, son of perdition. Now, was there just one Caesar that, that Paul was speaking about to the Thessalonians? No. He was speaking about the, the entire dynasty of consecutive Caesars that ruled over the pagan Roman Empire. Yet he refers to him as he. Who now and so does so does the Bible refer to the long succession, nearly eighteen hundred years of successory popes. Refers to him as he, the man of sin, the son of perdition. So don't let anybody tell you just on the basis of that of the wording of the Bible that we're talking about one single solitary man any more <clears throat> than Paul was talking about a single Caesar. Everybody knows it wasn't just one Caesar, the restrainer that Paul was talking about, but, but the entire office of the Caesars. Only after the fall of the office of the Caesars, the restrainer would be taken out of the way. 
And then that man of sin would be revealed. Just as the the, the restrainer is a single a, 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 a single word to describe a multitude of Caesars, so is the man of sin uh, used to describe a whole dynasty of popes, nearly 2,000 years of them. So you have, based on the language of the Scripture, you have no basis to believe in a single Antichrist, just as Paul had no belief, no reason to, to believe from his own words in a single Caesar that would be taken out of the way. It was the whole office of the Caesar. The entire government of, of, of Rome changed from the so-called pagan Roman Empire to the Holy Roman Empire. It was just one dynasty right after the other. One, a wicked dynasty replaced by an even more wicked dynasty. And this is why the early Christians prayed fervently, communally, repeated that prayer over and over and over in their assemblies, praying for the longevity of the pagan Roman Caesars, those wicked, evil ones that threw the, the, the Christians to the lions, made sport of shedding the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus, would be completely outdone by his papal successor. And the bloodshed of the papacy continues on a magnificent scale today. One that the pagan Roman Caesars could only have dreamed about. We, we all have nightmares about the stories of the pagan Roman Caesars, how they called them into the Colosseums and turned the lions loose and ripped them all to shreds, making mockery of Daniel's prophecy. Daniel, the prophet who was fed to the lions, only the lions wouldn't eat him. <clears throat> the angel of the Lord protected him. And Rome mocked Daniel, mocked his God by throwing Christians in the Colosseums and turning the lions loose on him, ripped them to shreds, killed them made sport of them shedding their blood. Can you imagine a more bloody institution than the Caesars of Rome? It was far outstripped by the papacy. And the papacy in its early days could only dream of her bloodshedding capability that she's achieved today through cooperative Roman Catholic governments like the United States of America. Is your country where you live, is it an ally of the United States of America? Does it share in her bloodshed? You ought to hang your head in shame. And you ought to speak out against your government for having anything to do with the United States of America. Yeah, and participate. You know, when you speak out against the government, then you are called a terrorist today. You so, have to be politically correct, Tom. And well, so to, were the early Christians. They were called swim. terrorists too. That's yeah, why the yeah, Caesars, the, the Caesars feared them, because they talked of another kingdom, a kingdom not of this world. Exactly. I know. It was treason. I'm it was it was sedition. It was why they joyed so much in killing Christians, because they 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 believed in a kingdom of righteousness. I'm just speaking to our listeners, Tom, and a little bit sarcastic to, under, to make them understand that when you swim with the mass, only dead fish swim with the river, uh, with, the, yeah. with the stream. You have to swim against the stream, and when you do that, you will make yourself known to the authorities, of course, and yeah. then your real faith will show whether yeah. you adhere to Jesus Christ and his teaching or to the Pope of Rome and his teaching. Who are you afraid of? The one who can destroy the soul and the body, or the one who can only destroy your body in this kingdom? Look, I, I think it appropriate at this time to make your listeners aware of a truth, one that I'm loath to recall. For 50 years of my life, I was a futurist. That's all they taught in the churches. I went to Pentecostal churches. I went to Baptist churches churches that I thought were Protestant. 
I called myself a Protestant, but I had no clue what a Protestant is. And God has granted me repentance of all of it. Now I am truly Protestant. I have peace with God. I await a kingdom to be brought to us by Jesus Christ. I exist in that kingdom today. I have no love or affection or loyalties to any earthly government or any earthly nation. I am a stranger in this world, just passing through, and I have to suffer this indignity. I guess so I'll so much the more appreciate the liberty whereby Christ hath made me free. So I have much of what to repent. I have much to repent of, and God has granted me that repentance. I hope and pray for every single one of your listeners, Yerk, to be granted the same repentance. Cross the border into Christ's heavenly kingdom. In Jesus' precious name, and King of kings and Lord of lords, my Messiah and Lord and King, Jesus Christ the righteous, the one who bled and died for us all, the one who bore our sins upon his body, the, ones who are the one who is going to liberate us from this sinful body and give us new bodies fit for his kingdom. In Jesus' precious name, I pray. Thank you, Tom. Those were very, very important words at this moment of the reading of this book. And you are grateful for that God opened your eyes after 50 years of indoctrination of futurism and Catholic indoctrination of false gospels, as much as I am grateful for God that he always kept me out of these churches and I never even had to learn all these atrocities and lies and he tipped me on the shoulder a few years ago and showed me the truth which I finally found in Jesus Christ and in the Bible and um, for that I am thankful every day that I also have chosen Jesus Christ the way the truth and the life the only way to the Father in heaven It is difficult to express these feelings when you are in this world to express what you are feeling for the spiritual world that is not to be seen, that is not to be touched, that is not to be smelled. And um, the point is that only when you are born again you will understand that, when you are truly born again, because otherwise you will have no conception of the spiritual kingdom of Jesus Christ actually and once you have that understanding and once you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord you will fear nothing in this world anymore because it all doesn't matter because we have a promise a promise of hope from our Lord for better times to come when we leave this world behind that we have in the time that we are here walk in the world but not be of the world okay the last paragraph in uh, the man of sin and the mystery of iniquity in the book all roads lead to rome still in chapter 19 bible prophecy and bible versions continues the encyclopedia britannica records that during those first centuries quote christians universally believed that the power that was retarding the revelation of the Antichrist was the Roman Empire. Unquote. It was and still is widely understood that the Apostle wrote to the Thessalonians mysteriously about the restraining of the Antichrist that he, not he in capital letter as in some Bible versions, who letteth will now let until be taken out of the way because he was referring to imperial Rome. Had he been more explicit and spelled out his belief that imperial Rome, which was restraining the Antichrist, would fall at some undetermined time, he would have brought the Christians, especially those in Thessalonica, 
into conflict with the ruling power. And also, he would have ended his ministry probably a little bit too early. Because when you spoke out at that time, that openly against the Roman emperors, well, the same thing happened as it will probably happen in the future again when you speak out about the Antichrist in a few years from now, or even now, today. I don't know. Nothing happened to me yet. Knock on wood. Nothing happened to Tom yet. Knock on wood. And let's pray that it stays this way. But when we continue to preach against the Antichrist of the Bible, who is the papacy in Rome, who is the ruler of this world, sooner or later we will probably hear, see or feel some consequences. And Paul, by that, was speaking in parables about it, was not openly speaking against the emperors, but was making it very clear that the he who now letteth and until he is taken out of the way, was the Roman Caesar of that time. So the next part of the book is called Witnesses to the Truth. Wycliffe, Tyndale, Luther, Calvin, Cranmer. In the 17th century Bunyan, the translators of the King James Bible and the men who published the Westminster and Baptist Confession of Faith, Sir Isaac Newton, Wesley, Whitfield, Jonathan Edwards, and more recently Spurgeon, Bishop J.C. Ryle, and Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, and I have to add Henry Gretton Guinness and James Aitken Wiley. These men, among countless others, all saw the office of the papacy as the Antichrist, that is substituting for Christ the new face of the old paganism that is Mystery Babylon in the Bible. They saw it all in the scriptures. It was quickened to them. They saw the counterfeit bride, the whore which would be judged at the end of history, in the description of Revelation 17, as do so many others today. So we read in Revelation chapter 17, verses 1 through 6. I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, and when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration." Unquote. The reformers saw the system for what it was, and they knew that they had to stand clearly against it. If they were right about that then, they are still right about it now, because God's word does not change. And God's word does not allow any compromise. These were the men described by one of their number, John Knox, as they that love the coming of the Lord, all were immensely burdened for the souls of those in bondage to such an evil and corrupt system, imprisoned in what Martin Luther called the Babylonian captivity of the church. The reformers had their heirs were uh, sorry, the reformers and their heirs were great scholars and knew the word of God and the Holy Spirit as a living teacher. They recognized and identified the false interpretations of Bible prophecy and the scholarly deceptions of the Jesuits and the Counter-Reformation, and they earnestly contended for the faith once given to the saints, as we can read in Jude, verse 3. They knew that it is the responsibility of all Christians to be a watchman, not just a special few with a special prophetic calling to speak out. 
From soon after the Reformation until late in the 19th century, their historical interpretation of the Antichrist in Scripture was to be found in the majority of Bible commentaries. This is no longer true today. In fact, we know of no Bible commentary published in the last 50 years that adopts this position. And I have to add here, because I told you I read this book from Ralph Woodrow, Babylon, Mystery Religion. In that book, 21 chapters, Ralph Woodrow not once addresses the papacy as the Antichrist. So when you follow my readings on my channel on that book, you will hear me reading a lot, uh, naming the name of Antichrist, but that was me reading and commenting of the book. That was not the author, Ralph Woodrow. And there is no publication of the last, now today, even 60, 70 or probably even 80 years, where you adopt, where it is adopted the position of Bible commentary that the Antichrist of Scripture is to be called out, the papacy as what it is. Bible versions, Protestantism and Ecumenism is the next part of this chapter. The principal reason for this is the proliferation of the new modern versions and commentaries, mostly based on the scholarship of the 1881 revised committee led by Anglo-Catholic Cambridge professors Westcott and Hort. Adherents of the King James or Authorized Version are convinced that the text adopted by the revised and modern versions are those which, as long, uh, as long ago as the 4th century, were rejected as corrupted during a period of Arian influence and which were subsequently discarded by the Reformation. Yeah, if you want to learn more about Westcott and Hort and if you want to learn more about the real um, coming from the King James Bible and uh, really want to understand the King James Bible that Tom and I uh, exclusively use in our English studies, um, then follow my readings of an understandable history of the Bible, the book from Samuel C. Gipp that I sometimes read in Hour of the, Tr uh, Hour of the Truth broadcast. Seven parts I've done so far, the next one still has to come um, or maybe it has come already, I don't know. Let's see in the future when this is published, we'll see about that. But that is a very fine book that I can advise you when you want to learn about Bible and Bible versions and when you want to learn about Westcott and Hort and what they did to the Word of God. The view of leading Protestant scholars today is that the King James Version is the only true Protestant Bible and the only one that really lends itself to the historical interpretation of the Antichrist. Now the author goes into a little footnote here, and the author has written a booklet on Bible versions, so that is Michael de Semlian, has written a booklet on Bible versions and the interpretation of Bible prophecy. That book is called All's Well uh, or Sound the Alarm, which affirms the reliability and purity of the authorized version, the King James Version, and argues that the scriptures have been undermined and the gospel watered down by the existence of a seemingly unending range of Bibles. It seems that the thus saith the Lord of the old authorized has given place among many modern versions and the choice of rendering of any particular verse that they afford to has God said, as we can refer to in Genesis 3 verse 1. From All's Well Sound the Alarm, another book from Michael the Semlian. You can look that up. And, yeah, um, I can only uh, underline that what is said here, that um, the King James Version is the only true preserved Bible in our time today. And again, I can refer you to the book Rulers of Evil, where there is a chapter that is called Marginalizing the Bible, that you will understand that after the uh, inception of the Jesuit order, their first works were to get the people off reading the Bible, something that the Reformation just brought to us, as Tom explained so very well in the beginning, when he was mentioning that the Reformers translated the Bible into the vulgar language, into the language of the lay people, so that they did not need 
the word of the priest who was reading from a corrupted Bible in Latin from the pulpit, but they could check that for themselves in their own language. So now when the people all of a sudden were in possession of the Bible in their own language and were to understand the word of God, they could uncover the lies of the Roman Catholic Church. And that, of course, is not to be allowed. So, therefore, the Jesuits were busy with marginalizing the Bible. And how can you do that? Well, first and for all, you forbid Bible reading and Bible study. And when you cannot do that, you take the Bible and you change the Bible. And you take out the divinity of Jesus Christ of the New Testament and you change things and you leave out verses and even whole chapters. And then the Bible has not the possibility to explain itself to you as the King James does when you read it, when you are filled with the Holy Spirit and you understand the Word of God. When they change the Bibles, the NIV, the RSV, the ASB, the New Living Translation, take all the Bibles that you want. All these Bibles came after the King James. None of these Bibles is older than the King James. Why? Because the King James is the original. Because the King James is the one that they took and changed. So when you adhere to a Bible, when you want to adhere to the Word of God, get yourself a 1611 authorized version of the King James Bible. Virtually all the other translations are regarded as having leanings toward liberalism and Romanism, clearly favoring the futurist view in the prophetic passages discussed earlier in this chapter. Even the new King James Version, like the King James, uses the Textus Receptus rather than the minority text Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, favored in the new editions, adopts this same futurist rendering, postponing the fulfillment of Antichrist into the indefinite future. One last word on the King James from my part. For the people who do not mind watching Seventh-day Adventist Walter fight, watch his documentary Battle of the Bibles and his two um, then later made parts Changing the Worlds Part 1 and 2, where he explains that, for example, in the new King James Bible, more than 6,000 changes were made in comparison to the King James Bible. In that three videos, Battle of the Bibles and Changing the Word, he gives you the real background, where the Bibles come from and where all these modern Bible versions are forged from. And if you say, well, Seventh-day Adventist, I don't want to look one video with that, with that person, with Walter Feit or any else, it doesn't matter, then you go to Gail Ripplinger. Get her book or watch her YouTube documentary, New Age Bible Versions. And you will understand why Tom and I say it's the King James and no else. And not with the Apocrypha. Also, very important. Leave that out. Only the 1611 King James authorized version as you can get it today without the Apocrypha is the true preserved word of God in the English language for Christians today. So we come to the last part of chapter 19 of All Roads Lead to Rome from Bible Prophecy and Bible, uh, Bible Versions called Ecumenism and the NIV, the New International Version. The ecumenical movement has ensured continuing cooperation among Catholics and Protestants on Bible translations and there have been innumerable conferences. The Driebergen Conference, held in June 1964 and attended by representatives to the United Bible Societies and the Roman Catholic Church, proposed the preparation of a common text of the Bible and a common translation, which would be acceptable to all. Well, what does that mean? Yes, compromise. If anything is acceptable to all, then there have to be made 
compromises. Do not compromise the inerrant word of God. In 1965, the Second Vatican Council ratified the Roman Church's approval of this, and in 1967, Carlo Mar Martini joined the UBS International Editorial Committee. Carlo Mar Martini is His Eminence Cardinal Carlo Maria Martini, Archbishop of Milan, the Vatican's predominant Greek scholar, a Jesuit who is thought of as a likely successor to Pope John Paul II. Okay, he didn't get that one. He is president of the Council of European Bishops' Conferences, with, uh, which represents 133,000 European churches. Cardinal Martini was a member of the UBS editorial committee for both the second and third editions of the Greek New Testament. The third edition of the United Bible Society's Greek New Testament, published in 1975, is a complete revision of the text produced previously, incorporating more than 500 changes which were made by Cardinal Carlo Martini and his four colleagues. The third edition was first issued several years before it was actually published. Its preface states that a textual commentary on the Greek New Testament in 1971, edited by Bruce M. Metzger on behalf of the committee, is based on this third edition. The second edition was produced three years earlier in 1968, so, quote, it appears that with no significant accretion, of new evidence, the same group of five scholars changed their mind in over 500 places. It is hard to resist the suspicion that they are guessing." Unquote. As we can read in Wilbur N. Pickering, The Identity of the New Testament. The New Latin Vulgate, authorized by Pope Paul VI in 1965, um, at the end or during the Second Vatican Council, that was, was issued by the Vatican and published by the German Bible Society, a member of UBS, in 1979 with a corrected Latin text which conforms to the same uh, UBS third edition of the Greek New Testament. In that same year, 1979, the German Bible Society published the 20th 26th edition of the Nestle Allen Greek New Testament with the Greek New absolutely identical to the UBS 3rd edition. The New Testament of the New International Version, the NIV that we are talking about here, is based on the UBS Nestle Allen Greek New Testament as are the majority of modern translations including the New Revised Standard Version, RSV, the New American Standard Version, NASV, the Revised English Bible, REB, and the Good News Bible. According to the International Bible Society, quoting Kenneth L. Barker's book, The NIV, The Making of the Contemporary Translation, the cryptic electic Greek New, text, uh, Greek New Testament text used was, quote, basically that found in the United Bible Societies, unquote, and Nestle's printed Greek New Testaments, which contained the latest and best Greek text available. Some Christians have suggested that the NIV could be called the New Catholic Version, given that the word Catholic means universal or international, and many evangelicals see the wide distribution of these ecumenical Bibles based on a common text authorized by the Vatican as an essential step towards union with Rome, the union between Protestants and Roman Catholics. If only the ecumenicals, if only the charismatics, if only the so many so-called Protestant Christians would understand that the Roman Catholic Church is not Christian, is the synagogue of Satan, represented by the man of sin, the son of perdition, the little horn of Daniel, 
the Pope, the Biblical, Historical and Prophetic Antichrist of the Bible. Tom, that was the whole chapter. Do you have some closing comments? Yes, just by way of refreshing. Number one, preterism is a lie that exonerates the papacy from the true onus of Antichrist. Futurism is a lie to take away the onus of Antichrist from the papacy. And all Bibles other than the authorized King James Bible, 1611, are Bibles written for the purpose of supporting either one of those lies, preterism or futurism. The true Bible of 1611 is the only Bible on the planet that can interpret itself. All other Bibles are blind and dumb and bound to lead you astray. Get yourself a King James 1611 without the Apocrypha, and you have the pristine, preserved Word of God. Read it, believe it, understand it, and have perfect fellowship with your Messiah, Jesus Christ, and burn all the other Bibles. And now that we've debunked and shown the obvious errors in preterism and futurism, and the reason that they were produced by the Roman Catholic Church, by the Jesuit order, was to shed the onus away from the papacy. Now you must know that it is the papacy, is the Antichrist. Okay? And now you must also know what the true interpretation of Bible prophecy is is called, it's called historicism. As we see the rise of Antichrist with the fall of the pagan Roman Caesars and has ruled this world throughout history. That's the Protestant belief. That's the belief of the first century Christians. That's the only belief that is consistent with Bible prophecy and history. All the others are obvious lies. You see, God didn't make it difficult for us to understand the truth. For those who are willing to take the time and to search out the truth, the truth becomes so obvious, it becomes a marvel that we ever have believed any of the lies. And it's easy to believe the truth. The truth just has a certain ring to it. Lies leave us in question. Lies leave us in ignorance. Lies leave us in uncertainty. There's none of that with the King James Bible and historicism. So come out of those lying churches. Start an independent Bible church. Meet with friends and family. It's, 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 eventually, we're going to be labeled as heretics We're going to be, well, we are. We've always been labeled as heretics. I mean, I'm not a member of the first generation that ever rose up against the papacy. <laughs> it, it's, it, it marks all true Bible-believing Christians. Every Bible believer, everyone that reads and understands his Bible comes to the same conclusion. There's no disunity among us. We know who the Antichrist is. We're just amazed that the whole world seems to be ignorant. And so now that we've laid out the consequences of believing all of those lies, now that we understand why our government seemed to have turned against us, we just need to understand now who they've turned toward, the papacy. They rule in behest of the papacy, the man of sin. They don't rule in our best interests. They rule in his best interest. And all we are is cannon fodder and a source of revenue for the papal crusaders. So let's repent of our sin. Let's have peace and unity with Christ and let the world fight. Because that's what it's prophesied to do. Wars, wars, and rumors of wars. The kingdom of Christ is not brought in by violence. It's brought in by faith and peace.
peace and grace. And it already exists. All you have to do is declare yourself a member of it. And remember, you cannot serve two masters. You either serve Christ or you serve Antichrist. That's all there is to it. And once you serve Christ, then you lose all loyalty for the Antichrist and the governments of the world. I will leave you with my blessing and peace from the one who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease 2,000 years ago. Jesus Christ, our Messiah, the only King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus Christ. He was the perfect and complete fulfillment of Daniel's 70-week prophecy. It ended 2,000 years ago. It was fulfilled 2,000 years ago. And the man of sin has ruled in his place almost since then. And now we're all made subject to him. That is, until we repent. Repent in the name of Jesus Christ. Repent of your preterism. Repent of your futurism. Become a Protestant Bible believer, a historicist, one who interprets the scriptures according to the fulfillment of history. Find the Antichrist where he was meant to be found in the papacy. Thanks, Yurt, for the invitation. I'll see you next time. Thank you, Tom. And I want to finish with uh, John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, do you really think, dear listener, that God deals treacherously with his people, that he sent his only begotten Son to perish in this world, to give his life for all of us, and then leave us blindly, not knowing who the adversary is, that he was going to reveal the Antichrist some distant years in the future and in the meantime all the reign of the bloody reign of the papacy is not the Antichrist? Do you really think that you can read the Bible and be betrayed by God in that way? For he loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and therefore then he betrayed the world afterwards by not telling them who the adversary is? If you believe that, then you do not believe in the God that I believe in. Because my God is righteous. My God is honest. And my God reveals and is the truth. And the truth is that the papacy as the Antichrist is revealed in his word, through his word, and God does not deal treacherously with us. The whole so-called Old Testament, the Law and the Prophets, pointed to the coming of the Messiah. And when he came and he gave his life to make us righteous before the Father again, he also gave us the knowledge of who is the enemy that we have to fight with in this world to get the understanding and to come to him eventually in the new heaven, in his kingdom, in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. So, thank you very much for watching the video and listening to chapter 19 of All Roads Lead to Rome, the book by Michael de Semlian, the chapter called Bible prophecy and Bible versions and thank you very much Tom for attending and uh, being my guest on this reading which I very much enjoyed and to my listeners until next time thank you for listening and watching God bless you and bye bye we as Bible believing Christians we know 
that the hand that is behind ISIS, the hand that is behind Al Qaeda, is the same hand that is behind the United States of America government, that is behind the European Union government, and that is behind all the armies in the world, and that is behind all these um, mercenary companies out in the world, like XE, or formerly called Blackwater, run by Knights of Malta, etc., etc. So this is something that you really have to understand. This is all just a theater. And the point is, where is this theater going to lead to? When you are a Bible-believing Christian, you know that in the end times, Jesus warned us in Matthew 24, there will be wars, wars, and rumors of wars. And we know that the Antichrist, by peace, will destroy many. And so on, and so on, and so on. I could start citing the whole Bible up and down right now with citations like this to tell you what it's all about. But I don't have to sing to the choir or preach to the choir. You as Bible-believing Christians already know that. So the only thing that I ask of you is don't be caught in their game. Because when you are and you play their game, you have to play by their rules. And their rules are not Christ's rules. So the only thing that I can advise you of is, okay, take that information in what happens about there. Pray for the people that these victims are being taken good care of and that they are just deceived people, that they maybe have a chance by going through this situation, maybe they have a way to find to Christ in this way. Maybe they have a way to find to the real truth. I mean, these people are Muslims and coming from Muslim countries and coming to so-called, quote-unquote, Christian countries. Of course, the Roman Catholic Church is not Christian. Of course, the Protestant churches today don't preach any protest anymore. All right, I know that. But still, here and there, it is possible that a grain falls on the ground that can fall on fruitful ground, even with these refugees and the whole situation that is coming up. And that is the hope that we should have as Bible-believing Christians, and that is the prayer that we should use every day when we address our Lord to pray for our enemies as we pray for our friends. Because Jesus said, love your enemies and love your neighbor.